Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to episode 48 of uh, Chess Basics, things every chess player ought to know. This is the 48th and final episode of the series. I'm ra wrapping it up. I wanted to uh, kick off this video by saying a few words about the series. Um, I started this in uh, February, February of 2013, and as I'm making this video now, it's uh, June of 2014. So it took me a year and uh, four months to do the series. Uh, Chess Basics number one was the first um, video that I uploaded on this channel, so that's how long this channel has been in operation. Um, the series has been uh, tremendously popular, um, it, uh, and it continues to be popular. When I look at the list of the uh, top videos on my channel in any given week, um, there the list is dominated by uh, videos off of the uh, Chess Basics series. So people are still continuing to uh, find these videos and view them, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback on the videos. Um, the top episodes, um, I'm just about to break a thousand views on uh, Chess Basics number 17. That's my uh, most viewed video of all time at this point. Um, it's got 990 views. That was number 17 was the uh, video I did on the exchange variation of the Rui Lopez. Uh, runner up, uh, we have in Chess Basics number 13 uh, on Legal's Mate. That has uh, 970 views. And uh, Chess Basics number one with the uh, the rule of the square is uh, at number three with 943 views. So uh, another week or so, I'll probably break a thousand views on on one of those because, as I say, we continue to get uh, new views on those old videos. So very happy with the progress of the videos overall. Um, and uh, I think this is a good time to uh, finish off the series, as I've mentioned in some of the previous ones. I've covered all the things that I wanted to say. Um, there are a few things that belong in Chess Basics, and I didn't cover them just because they are covered well on other channels in, um, on YouTube. So I just didn't want to repeat what was out there. And this is the first one. Um, the first thing that I think every chess player ought to know that I didn't cover here <laughs> is the opera game. Uh, this is a game played between Paul Morphy and uh, the Duke Carl of Brunswick and Count Isward. It was played at the Opera House in Paris in 1858. Um, I'll, in the description of this video, I'll put in uh, links to uh, a couple of uh, channels, a couple of videos uh, that cover this game, so you can, you can see the game. Um, if there was one game that uh, that you were going to memorize uh, from start to finish. This would be the game I would recommend. Uh, it's just a beautiful game. Every move that uh, Morphy makes, he has the white pieces, is uh, just logical, and it just builds uh, on on the previous moves. His opponents were not bad. Um, Duke Carl of Brunswick was, was not a bad player, um, and so they put up some resistance, um, but they were just uh, completely outmatched. And uh, this uh, position on the board, if you want a little chess puzzle while you're listening to me rambling, this position on the board is uh, taken from that game, and it's uh, White's turn to move, and this is the final combination from the game. So there's a, a game-ending combination right here. Uh, and I'll give you the answer later on in the video. <laughs> uh, so like I said, this has already been covered on YouTube, and I'll, I'll put in the description, I'll put links to those videos. Another thing uh, I didn't talk about and maybe I should have, but uh, anyway, I'm winding up the series now, so I'm not going to talk about it. I didn't talk about peace endings. Um, there are simple peace endings, like uh, king and rook against king. And I think they are easy enough that uh, you should be able to figure out how to do them on your own, even if you don't know how. Just uh, try it. <laughs> now put a king and a rook on the board, put a lone king against it, and uh, see if you can mate that king. Um, it's a good exercise if you don't know how to do it already. Um, it'll teach you a few things about the game. It may seem hard at first um, because there are a few little tricks. Um, it has to do with uh, using tempo moves and, and uh, things like that. Uh, but it's, it's well within the range of what you can figure out on your own. Another uh, uh, piece ending along the same lines is the case of two bishops. So king and two bishops against a lone king. This is a bit trickier, uh, but again, I think it's the kind of opening... Uh, or in game rather that you can figure out on your own. I don't have to teach you, and there's some value in figuring it out on your own um, because you you remember it better. 
Um, so I was, uh, as a little side story, I was uh, teaching a class of kids, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to demonstrate to them the two bishops against the king and how to mate. I was near the end of the series uh, of uh, classes I was giving, and uh, you know I was I was uh, making a few moves and, and looking at the board and, and trying to decide what the <laughs> next move was. And one uh, kind of smart aleck kid from the class said, "Are you sure you know how to do this?" <laughs> but uh, but you can figure it out. Um, so two one rook will win, two bishops will win, two knights uh, do not win. If you have a king and two knights against a king, that's a draw. Um, and the problem is that uh, you can use your king and the knight to trap your opponent's king in the corner, and then you could use your second knight to uh, give him a checkmate, but you have to move that knight to get it into position to deliver the checkmate, and, uh, and your opponent's king is out of moves at that point, and it's a stalemate. Uh -huh. Which means that actually you can win sometimes. If you have two knights and your opponent has a pawn, uh, you can sometimes win because you can effectively stalemate him, uh, but he has the pawn. Force him to move the pawn, and that gives you time to maneuver your other knight in to deliver the checkmate. Um, so that brings us to the intermediate case, which is bishop and knight versus uh, king. King and bishop and knight versus king. And that is a win. You can checkmate with bishop and knight versus a king, um, but it's not easy. And uh, it's not something that you can figure out on your own unless you're, you're pretty bright. That's, it's a hard thing to figure out. But there is uh, a video on YouTube explaining how to do it. And so I'm going to include a reference to that if you, want to, uh, if you want to learn that. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's every chess player ought to know it. It's something that's uh, interesting but not, doesn't crop up that often. But it is instructive, too, in, in that it shows how the bishop and the knight uh, can work together to coordinate. Um, so it's, it's worth knowing, I would say. Put it in that category. Okay, so with that out of the way, I wanted to go on to the main topic of this video, which is, you know, where do you go from here? How do you uh, continue to improve your chess? I'm sort of assuming that you want to keep improving, that that's why you're watching these videos. Um, you know, I think there needs to be a balance. I don't think improving your chess is the only thing. I think you need to be getting out there and playing it and enjoying it. And if your chess is at a level that you're happy with, uh, there's no reason why you need to go off and uh, memorize a bunch of silly in games, uh, you know, it just depends on what your interests are. Um, but if you do want to improve your chess, I have some definite recommendations. And the first one is for you to play some slow games, games at a time control where you have a minute or more uh, per move to think about it. So a time control like uh, on ICC, the 45-45 time control, that's a, considered a slow time control. Uh, I consider it a slow time control. Um, or um, over the board games where you have uh, at least an hour per side. You know, if you're down to a half hour, you're, you're into the uh, blitz range, I think. So games where you have at least an hour per side. The slow games that I am used to, um, you know, usually it's like an hour for the first 30 moves, sometimes 90 minutes for the first 40 moves, or a game in two hours. So, so um, you know, averaging maybe two minutes a move. If you think of game an hour and uh, and uh, average game lasting 60 moves, and that's that's basically a minute a move. So one to two minutes a move. Uh, it gives you a lot of time, and it uh, hopefully if you're you're spending your time wisely, it eliminates um, those silly uh, blunders where you just overlook tactics, and it gives you an opportunity to really think about what's going on in the game and how best to move it forward. And so that's step one: is to play these slow games. Step two is to record them and uh, look at them afterwards. So uh, you can look at them with the help of a chess engine, but it, I think it's even better. If you have a friend who's a good player, um, it's, it's really helpful to uh, look at those games uh, with somebody else. You get a human perspective, not just uh, the computer perspective, because the computer will find all kinds of moves that you might have played that are uh, you know, too deep and you know, not realistic for a person to discover over the board. Whereas uh, you know, if you're analyzing with a friend, and he spots a move, you know, well, then obviously that's a move that, that you could have seen uh, within the time available. So it, it's a better way of finding out what are, what are the kinds of moves that you're missing. So um, that's, that's step two. Record your games and analyze them afterwards. And then step three is to look at patterns. You know, where, um, where do you fall down? What kind of mistakes do you make um, that cause you to lose the games? Are you losing tactically? Are you getting bad positions out of the opening? Or are you getting into uh, end games where you don't know what's going on and you don't play the end game well? Or, or do you get into middle games that are confusing and you don't know what's going on? 
Is that why you're losing the game? So identify these patterns and you know work on the things that are causing you the most trouble. Um, I'll give my own uh, history in chess as an example. I, I started out as an adult. I didn't play as a child, at least not in rated games. I just played casually. Learned to play from my dad. Played with my learned to play from my dad. Played games with my friends. That kind of thing. Uh, so when I was in my uh, 20s, I started playing in a tournament chess. And uh, I had read a bit about chess, so I, I knew a few things. I had read some books. And um, I thought I was pretty good. <laughs> and uh, I quickly discovered I wasn't that great. Uh, so I, I ended up after my first tournament with a provisional rating that placed me in uh, Class D. So that's uh, between 1,200 and 1,400 in the U.S. rating system. And that, that's pretty far down the totem pole <laughs> among average players. Uh, you know, maybe Class B is, is probably average among active players in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, your own experience may differ. You know, if you're uh, playing your first tournament games as a child, uh, you know, under the age of, uh, you know, still in high school or younger, a lot of them start out with a rating of around 600. So, I mean, the, the ratings go down 400 to 600. The ratings can go all the way down to zero, I think, um, but uh, somewhere in that range, you play your first game. I think most adults are, are uh, when they're playing in their first tournaments, um, are around 1,000 to 1,200 in, in that range. Um, so that's what you might expect. Um, and, but the thing is, your, your initial ratings are provisional, and they change rapidly as you uh, play. And um, so what I discovered in my early games was I was just moving impulsively. <laughs> and uh, the first thing I, I learned was uh, to sit on my hands, actually. <laughs> so I would uh, literally sit on my hands during the game, so I couldn't just pick up a piece and move it. And uh, it wasn't until I, uh, I uh, was really sure I, I knew what move I was going to play that I would release one of my hands and make the move. Um, and uh, just by doing that, I was able to gain a couple hundred rating points and uh, work up to Class C. Um, going from Class C to Class B was a little more difficult, though. Um, that required uh, a little, little more um, <clears throat> study, and um, that was where I first noticed that uh, I was weak in the end games. And uh, I was, uh, of course, uh, somewhere around Class C or Class B is where you start finding yourself in games that, that go the distance. Before that, uh, you, your games will end in an explosive uh, <laughs> blunder of, uh, by one side or the other, typically. And... Uh, but as you get better, the games last longer, and uh, you get into more in-game positions, so it becomes more of a concern, and that's when I started to learn about things like the uh, Rook and Pawn in-games that I covered in the Chess Basics series. So um, the, um, the topics, that's how I selected the topics in Chess Basics. Just These were things that I found out, uh, most of them, you know, some of them were even more elementary, some of them I, I knew already, but a lot of them were things I found out as I played, or things that I noticed that other players didn't know uh, that, that really... Uh, I thought they, they ought to know. Um, so that's those are the ways uh, you can improve. Um, in terms of the things that uh, have helped me the most, um, let's talk first about tactics. Um, I play um, tactics online at a um, uh, web server. It's called the Chess Tactics Server. I'll give a link to it in the description. It's, it's free, and that's a good way to practice your tactics. The best book on tactics that I have found is a, a book with a very funny title. It has the title, How to Beat Your Dad at Chess. <laughs> but if you can ignore the silly title, it's actually quite a good book. And again, I'll put this in the description. Um, the, uh, the book has uh, a collection of tactical patterns, 50 patterns in, in total. Most of them are mating patterns, things like Legal's Mate and Philidor's Mate that I covered in the series. But he has a lot more of them. And uh, each pattern, he gives a lot of examples, and then there are uh, quizzes. So you can, um, you can uh, work through his examples. You can uh, take, take the quizzes, see if you can apply what you've learned in the patterns. And it's just a, a great way to uh, learn tactics because he gives each pattern a name, and it's uh, just well organized. I like the whole thing. So I think it's a good, good way to improve your tactical sense, that and uh, playing actively and, uh, and working on tactics at a tactics server. Um, the other book I would like to recommend, there, there's two books I think that improved my chess the most, and that was one of them, the How to Beat Your Dad at Chess. And the other one is a book called My System by Aaron Nimzovich. And once again, I'll put, I'll put links in the description. Um, so My System is a book, it's, it's somewhat old. It was, uh, at this point, it was written in the uh, 20th century, in the 1930s, I believe. Um, 
but it's uh, a really fascinating book. Um, well, the reason I mention it's old is you can't really trust everything that's in there. And I think that's true of chess books in general. You need to be somewhat skeptical of the books that you read, um, particularly uh, old books because uh, they didn't check them on uh, chess engines back in those days. And they're just uh, lots of mistakes. Chess is a complicated game. So you can't take everything at face value. And even the modern books, a lot of authors are just copying material from older books and not checking it. Um, so you can find uh, um, blunders <laughs> in even recently prepared books. So, um, so be skeptical of all books. Um, what's so great about this book is um, it gives you an entire vocabulary for thinking about chess strategy. And um, if you read the book and if you've read other commentators talking about chess, you'll realize that, that uh, uh, Nimzovich is just being quoted all over the place without credit, you know, just the common language that people have in describing these positions. A lot of these terms originated with Nimzovich, things like the hanging pawns, things like um, uh, the, the phrase about the past pawn. The past pawn is a, a prisoner that uh, is like a dangerous criminal that needs to be kept under lock and key. That was, that was Nimzovich. <laughs> Uh, so he just had a great way with words, and it, it, the book is just full of ideas. They're not always uh, entirely correct. For example, um, he says you should always uh, attack a pawn chain at the base, when in fact there are many times when you want to attack a pawn chain at the head. But um, it just gives you a real stock of ideas. Uh, so you should always enter each position uh, that you play somewhat skeptically. You can't just rotely apply things you learn. But... Uh, but it gives you a stock of ideas and ways to think about the game that's uh, really, uh, I think, improve your chess a lot if you study it seriously. So those are the two books I recommend. Um, and then uh, for, oh, actually, I have a third book. For the end game, if you decide the end game is, is where you need to improve or an area you would like to improve, I want to recommend the book um, Silman's Complete End Game Course. Um, and I'll have a description of it in the a pointer to it in the description. Um, but it's a great book on the end games that is organized according to your level. So it starts off with, uh, you know, if you're a beginner player, these are the things you ought to know. And then it goes on to the next level. If you're, you know, playing in tournaments with a rating, you know, class B or class C, then these are the things you ought to know. And I found it pretty accurate um, that uh, as I went to class B to, from class C and uh, to class A from class B, uh, these were, the, in fact, the things I needed to know. There was a point when I really needed to know how to mate with the king and pawn, a rook and pawn, and there were times when I needed to know how to draw, and that was that was right about uh, at the level he suggested in his book. So organized in a very practical way, and um, and a clear, well-written description. So I think uh, I can recommend that book. Um, there's lots of resources on YouTube, and uh, one thing I want to recommend is... Um, if you have um, problems sort of formulating strategy or plans, you know, so you don't have, you know, problem just specific with tactics or end games or openings, um, there are one of the best ways to uh, deal with that is to uh, look at complete games that have been annotated. And there's uh, a lot of uh, video annotators that are doing a great job on, uh, on YouTube. So, uh, you know, I, I have at the side of the my channel. I have um, featured other channels, other featured channels, something. I forget what it's called, but uh, I have a list of channels where people that have really uh, great instructional content. Um, so Chess Explained has done this where he's uh, um, done an analysis of complete uh, games. He does this for tournaments, and he's also done some historical games. Um, there are the uh, Chess Club at St. Louis has a, a, a YouTube channel and they have a bunch of uh, great videos. They have grandmasters come in and give talks. And, um, and a lot of times these grandmasters will analyze a game. And in fact, there was... Uh, um, well, first I'll mention that I really like the uh, videos that Yasser Sarawan does. So if, uh, if you want to look uh, through the channel for uh, <coughs> Yasser Sarawan's video, videos, he really has a great uh, positional sense. So it's a, it's a great way to start. Um, there was a video they uploaded recently. It was by Robert Hungaski, who was uh, actually an American uh, grandmaster, a young American grandmaster, who did a really nice video on uh, a couple games he played in the Sicilian Sveshnikov. I thought really clear explanations and talking about sort of the common mistakes and misunderstandings, because the first game is when he lost, and then the second game is when he won. So um, I'll put a pointer to that one in the video as well. 
Um, so other channels, um, MSK Chess is a, a channel that I just became aware of recently. Um, and uh, he's got a, a number of great videos where he's talking about some middle game ideas. And uh, his videos cover the range of uh, uh, both both uh, beginner and intermediate uh, chess uh, topics. Um, and they're, they're nicely organized. There's, there's a video, for example, on how to attack a fianchettoed king position. So I can, I can recommend uh, checking out some of those videos. And uh, one more channel I wanted to mention. Um, I have a YouTube friend, Akul Chilar, who's got a new channel he's working on. It's called Chess 24 by 7. And he's uh, going to start a new series of videos uh, on the topic of improving your chess uh, based on the book called uh, Reassess Your Chess, who I think, uh, I think that's also by Selman. Um, so it's an interesting book. I haven't uh, gone through the whole book myself, but I've, I've had it recommended to me and I've, I've taken a look at it. So it uh, should be an interesting topic, um, collection of topics there for you. So those are uh, some additional YouTube resources. Um, and is that everything I wanted to cover? I think that's everything. Um, like I said, I think um, the main point of playing chess is to enjoy it. I think most people are not going to become <laughs> grandmasters. That's really a, a pretty small group that really make it uh, all that way and can make a living at uh, doing chess. So, um, But improving your chess uh, understanding is not all just about uh, improving your game or improving your results. It's also about uh, improving your understanding of the game so you can appreciate some of the, the great stuff that uh, is being played out there. I noticed... Uh, as I became uh, stronger as a player, uh, there were, you know, when I when I first uh, would look at games played by chess masters, the games would sometimes just end, and I'd go, huh, "Why did the game end there? What's going on?" Um, as I got better, you know, as I uh, got uh, more sharper tactically, I uh, began to recognize uh, why the games ended when they did. You know, there's usually some uh, tactic in the position that uh, the uh, other guy didn't find a way to refute, and he just had to resign. Uh, you you get to spot more things like that. And you get to appreciate more of what's going on in the game. And, um, you know, there's just a, a certain beauty to the game. Uh, people find it inherently attractive. So um, And it's just a way, as you understand it more, it's a way to increase your appreciation of the game. As for myself, I am going to um, uh, start a new uh, series called uh, Basic Chess Openings. And... Um, or, what, what was I? I had a name for it. Something like that. <laughs> anyway, you will see it. And uh, I'm going to cover the openings uh, in a similar fashion to the way I covered uh, the Rui Lopez and the Queen's Gambit in this uh, series, in the, in the Basic Chess series. But I'm going to um, just uh, go through more openings. I'm going to leave it at about the same level of detail. Um, this is my own approach for uh, uh, learning about the openings which is to just uh, get kind of a rough idea of how to play the openings, get uh, the first few moves down and uh, see if I can understand some of the ways that it's played, and then go out and play it. Um, particularly playing it in blitz games is a good way to find out uh, what, you know, you'll, get, you'll run into all kinds of different replies that you hadn't, uh, hadn't seen considered, and finding ways to uh, answer those is how you really uh, learn an opening. I think uh, I personally find it really difficult to learn an opening just from an opening book. So I don't have any uh, opening books other than uh, Modern Chess Openings. I got that um, before I started um, using the internet so much to look up openings. Nowadays when I research my games and to try and figure out where I went wrong in the opening, I'll, I'll typically just look on uh, chessgames.com and uh, I, have a, I have a subscription there and they, they have a thing called the Opening Explorer where you can play through your game and see uh, other games, master games that have reached the same position and see what, what moves they're playing. Because you do need to, to work on your openings. You can't just, uh, <clears throat> I think it's hard to learn them from a book. Uh, you, after you start playing them, people will play moves that are not in the book. And, uh, you know, you're not really going to have any idea what's going on until you've, you've played a bunch of games in that opening. Um, so that's my advice on learning openings. And, um, and I will be uh, talking about that a little bit more in the, in the opening series that I'm going to do and also how you might uh, construct a repertoire. So I hope you guys are looking forward to that. Um, and as for this series, it's a wrap. Thanks for all of the uh, comments. And uh, if you have anything else to say, just uh, make comments on the video in the section below. See you all later. Bye.